Welcome to lesson 2 of the Decisions During Uncertainty toolset, Risk Tolerance. This lesson describes the role risk tolerance plays in our decision making and provides two approaches for incorporating the extent of our willingness to take risks in our decision making. This lesson consists of this presentation together with a lesson guide to help you accommodate your risk tolerance when making decisions. The most common example used to illustrate how risk tolerance varies with individual is to ask anyone who chooses to save their money how they save it. Those who don't like taking risks, that is they have a low tolerance to risk, might keep their money in a bank deposit account that pays interest. At the other end of the spectrum, there are those who choose to invest all their savings in stocks and shares. Since this is a spectrum, most of us will sit somewhere in between the two extremes, choosing to save some money in the bank and have some money in low-risk or high-risk investments, or a combination of all three. So our willingness to take a risk, our risk tolerance, describes how prepared we are to take a chance on an uncertain consequence in order to realise a positive outcome for ourselves. In Lesson 1, Risk Profiles, we saw how Franny reached her decision to downsize rather than remaining in her current home. Her decision was based on the more desirable consequences downsizing provided, as well as the higher likelihood of realising her decision objectives. This highlights the important roles desirability and probability play in the way we make decisions, since the more desirable the consequences of a risk profile, when compared to poorer consequences, the more willing we are to take the necessary risks to get them. And, the greater the chances of realising better consequences, compared to the chances of realising poorer consequences, the more desirable the risk profile becomes. To illustrate this point, consider the opportunity to double a £1,000 stake to £2,000 on the flip of a coin. The desirability of doubling their money will motivate some people to take the bet, while the prospect of a 50% chance of losing their money can be a turn-off to others. If the return on the £1,000 stake was quadrupled to £4,000, more people than previously might consider taking the bet, because to them, £4,000 is significantly more desirable than £2,000 and would be worth taking a bet on. It's important to note here that some people may still avoid taking the bet and would consider to do so until an even more desirable return was realised. Alternatively, if the £1,000 stake and the opportunity to double it stayed the same, but instead, through the use of a weighted coin, the chances of them losing their money was decreased to say 20%, some of those who were turned off by the original odds would now consider taking the bet if there was an 80% chance of winning. Again, there may be some people who still wouldn't be willing to part with their £1,000 until the odds were increased even further. When we make a decision involving uncertainty, understanding how our risk tolerance is influenced by both chance and desirability can help us when it comes to selecting one alternative over another. Incorporating your risk tolerance into your decision making involves doing three things. 1. Think about the desirability of each consequence. 2. Balance the desirability of each consequence with its chance of occurring. 3. Choose the most attractive alternative. Here's an example of how to use this approach. John Peterson works as a freelance project manager. While working on his current contract, John has been using his spare time to develop an e-learning website for project managers. He's building the website to extend his career into computer-based training. Close to finishing his current contract, John has been offered two six-month part-time contracts by two customers with whom he's worked with before. Since both contracts are due to start at the same time, John needs to decide which one he'll accept. Because finishing his website is important to him, and since his last contract generated three quarters of his annual income in just six months, John's decision objective is to select the contract that provides him with the most amount of free time to continue his website development. Contract A is a three days a week contract, while contract B 
is a two days a week contract. The daily rate for contract A is £600 a day, while the daily rate for contract B is £500 a day. Making a decision is not straightforward, however. From previous experience with both customers, John knows that more often than not, he will have to work more days than originally contracted, thereby reducing the number of free days available to him to work on his website. John builds the following risk profile. He knows that there's a 25% chance that the company offering contract A will ask him to work an extra day a week. There's a 40% chance that the company offering him contract B will also ask him to work an extra day. While he would be making more money as a consequence of working an extra day, he'll make less progress with his website, significantly less with contract A due to having to work up to four days a week compared to contract B where he will be working up to three days a week. 1. Think about the desirability of each consequence. Having completed his risk profile, John considers each of the consequences. What he realises is that completing the website is more desirable to him than the revenue he could earn from either contract. The closer he can get to completing the website, the better. Two, balance the desirability of each consequence with its chance of occurring. What surprises John is the impact a 25% chance of having to work an additional day on contract A has on the progress he will make with the website. While there is a 1 in 4 chance of working a 4 day week on this contract, the impact it will have on the website's development is a chance that he's just not willing to take. When it comes to completing the website, John would rather earn less money and complete the site than earn more money and have less time to work on it. 3. Choose the most attractive alternative Based on his desire to complete the website and the 25% chance of completing just over a third of it after 6 months, John decides that he will accept contract B. Incorporating your risk tolerance into your decision making a quantitative approach. There will be occasions when it's hard to reach a decision by doing a visual check of the consequences and their probabilities of occurring. These situations can be complex, making it difficult to adopt the kind of qualitative approach that John took when reaching his decision. Here's John's situation again, but this time with an additional level of complexity. Just as he's about to make a call to accept contract B, John receives two emails. The first, from the company offering contract A, informs him that the contract starts next month, September. John's contact explains that there have been a couple of issues with getting the project off the ground, however, it's very likely that the project will start on time. Confident that he's already made the right decision, John opens the email about contract B. After reading it, John's glad that he hadn't yet made the call. It turns out that the contract B project has been delayed until October. And to make matters worse, his contact tells him that there's a chance that the project might not even happen due to funding problems. The first thing that John does is to call both of his contacts to understand the likelihood of both these contracts taking place. He learns that contract A, scheduled to start in September, has an 85% chance of happening. Contract B, which has been delayed by a month and won't start until October, has a 65% chance of occurring. John redraws the risk profile to capture this latest turn of events. Reviewing the risk profile, John finds it's hard to reach a decision. Previously, his decision revolved around how complete he could make his website during the six-month contract period, confident in the knowledge that he would also be earning an income. Now, that income is no longer guaranteed, and to add to the complexity, the contracts are staggered by a month. If he decides to go with contract B, he would have to wait two months before he knows whether or not he has work. 
John decides to apply a quantitative approach to help him with his decision making. This approach involves doing three things. One, assign a desirability score to each consequence. Two, balance the desirability of each consequence with its chance of occurring. And three, select the most attractive alternative. Assigning a desirability score to each consequence is a two-step process. Step one, rank each consequence from best to worst using one as the best case and the total number of consequences as the worst case. Step two, assign a desirability score of between zero and 100 to each consequence, where 100 is the most desirable. Use the ranking from step one to help guide you. John's rankings look like this. Because 100% of the website complete and no income occur twice, John decides to assign them the same rank. Hence one, the best, for 100% of the website complete and six, because there are six different consequences, the worst, for no income. Having sorted his table so that the rankings are in descending order, John assigns a desirability score of 100 to the best consequence and zero to the worst consequence. Compared with completing the website, he decides that a revenue of between 39,600 and 52,800 pounds will be halfway between the best and worst consequences. So he gives this a score of 50. For the revenue of 22 to 33,000 pounds, John assigns this a score of 25. Since completing the website is a priority, he assigns the 38 to 75% completion a desirability score of 70, while the 75 to 100% complete consequence is assigned a score of 90. Balance the desirability of each consequence with its chance of occurring. Having assigned desirability scores for each consequence, they need to be multiplied by the chance of that consequence occurring. Doing this helps to provide perspective or balance to each consequence's desirability. For example, if a £1 UK lottery ticket has a prize of £1 million, multiplying the consequence, £1 million, by the chance of winning the lottery, 0.000000007%, gives us 7 pence. So while we may win £1 million, the more realistic consequence of buying a £1 lottery ticket is winning 7 pence. John needs to apply this same principle to his desirability scores to understand what kind of scores he might realise based on the probability of each consequence occurring. Select the most attractive alternative. Having balanced his desirability scores against the chances of their consequences occurring, John obtains the following results. Selecting the most attractive alternative involves adding up all of the desirability scores for each alternative and seeing which has the highest score. For John, going with contract B is the most attractive alternative based on his strong desire to complete the website. The more desirable the consequences of a risk profile relative to the poorer consequences the more willing we are to take the necessary risks to realise them. When we understand the relationship between a consequence's desirability and its chances of occurring, we can adopt a qualitative approach to our decision making. When the situation proves to be a complex one, where the relationships are not so clear, use a quantitative approach to help identify the most attractive alternative.